Okay, we should be up and running. So, this is podcast number five. Um, that's ten, by the way. <laughs> podcast number five. I am joined with my lovely wife, Lissa, today. It is her first time being on the podcast. We have done a practice podcast together. Are you excited about being on Swim Out of the Box podcast? So excited. So excited. S- sounds good. What are we talking about today? We we're talking about recovery and the propulsive phase. So if you uh, are just downloading this podcast, this is number five for us. So you've missed the first four. You might want to go back and check them out. Uh, in the first four podcasts, we talked about... Do you have the list up? It was... Um, it posture, was kicking, rotation, rotation, and the last podcast was breathing, mm-hmm. uh, and this one, as we mentioned, is recovery and propulsive phase. So the reason why we've kind of put those two uh, seemingly different things together, the recovery mm-hmm. and the propulsive phase, is because they're connected. They're so connected that they affect one another. Um, the recovery. So freestyle mm-hmm. recovery is just whenever your arm is out of the water, coming back forward. So that's what the recovery is. The above portion of the stroke. Yes. Above the water portion. Above the water. Portion of the stroke. Uh, Traditionally, I would say there's two different types of recovery. There is the relaxed recovery, which as of recently has been called a high elbow recovery, which is just... Wrong. What's the word? Not a nomenclature, but a, like a, a, it's just misused, right? Uh, I think people were confusing a high elbow catch with a high elbow recovery, mm-hmm. but it's not a real thing, right? It's called a relaxed recovery, or the other one is a straight arm recovery. Um, so straight arm recovery versus a relaxed recovery. I've done a lot of playing around with this with my clients and uh, figuring things out with it. Uh, I, my preference is for people to recover with not a perfectly straight arm, but a mostly straight arm. And the reason for that is, is the straighter your arm is, the less likely you are to injure your shoulder. If injure your shoulder how? So a relaxed recovery has a lot of moving parts to it. Okay. So you have to have good timing. You have to have, you have to make sure your rotation is at a minimum of 45 degrees and it has to which is important because if you rotate too much you can lose your balance right so so good timing good timing good rotation mm-hmm. good and amount of rotation is that the same thing say that again good amount because we were just saying 45 to 90 you know you can still do a relaxed recovery at 90 it's not preferred you're not so, you shouldn't be doing it okay um, but you can still do it you know So, just making sure you're at least 45 degrees, Mm -hmm. making sure the hip rotates before the arm attempts to exit the water. So those two things have to happen first. Then, when you kind of include the elbow joint into that motion, so when the elbow bends, it's very easy for people to bring the movement into the front of their shoulder, almost like their their pec and their pec minor, like right in the top front of their shoulder versus their back. Say that again? And the joint, right? Yeah, so it's basically the joint. So they're basically kind of taking the posture that they would use at sitting at a desk where their shoulders are rounded and then trying to recover on it. I don't know why, but Evie's very upset. If you have if you don't know, Evie's our French bulldog Evie, who is come here. very upset for some reason. Hi. Um so just making sure that people use their shoulder properly. Right, use the mm-hmm. back to recover versus the shoulder joint, and it's a lot more difficult to avoid using the shoulder joint uh, during a relaxed recovery. It's just some mechanical issues with okay. it. And fun fact: we all know that this isn't just us lying and saying be careful because who has a tear in their shoulder labrum? You do. You know, you you mouth that and we can't hear. <laughs> yeah, Lissa does. I had surgery on both of my shoulders by. The age of 21, I believe, um, because I just had bad technique and nobody was correcting it. Uh, so I take shoulder health very seriously. It's the reason why I actually got into coaching was for to, to make sure anyone that wanted to swim could swim 
Um, because what happened to my shoulder shouldn't happen to anybody else. It mm-hmm. just shouldn't. Um, it can be prevented. It's easily preventable. It is. With good technique. And I've never seen safe technique, right? Mm-hmm. So injury-free technique, be slow. You don't need to go slow in order Time to make lines, sure. You yeah. Like, yeah. In order to make sure you're not going to hurt yourself. Because mm-hmm. if you have good technique, you will not hurt yourself. Um, but the recovery is often overlooked as a point of injury. So we get a lot of clients at swim box that will come in and go, my shoulder really hurts. I think it's from pulling. A lot of the times it's how they recover because they're under rotated and they're trying to pick their elbow up out of the water. Mm -hmm. And then they've done something to the joint, whether it's the labrum or the ligaments. It's very easy to disrupt your shoulder joint because it's a complicated joint. In that same vein, because it is so complicated, it can be fixable without surgery. Like, you could fix the movement. By fixing your technique, you can avoid surgery. Right. Now, if it's bothering you day to day, that's a different issue. Right. We're not doctors. We're just saying, right. usually, it's fixable without surgery. Right. Um, okay, so, so, back to relaxed recovery. Right. Good timing, good rotation. Use the back of your shoulder and avoid using the front. Slash your joint. Right. Uh, I used to really emphasize a relaxed recovery Mm -hmm. in freestyle. Just with any of your clients? With any of my clients. Very few clients would I focus on a straight arm recovery. It would be more recent that I've decided that it's not worth trying to retrain the movement patterns into a relaxed recovery. There's just too many variables that mm-hmm. people can mess up. Especially because most people have been swimming for years. I've been swimming for over 25 years. Yeah. I still have to focus to make sure that I don't fall into my old habits. Right. Like it's not, and I've been working on, on this same thing using my, having my shoulder blade glide as opposed to putting the force into my shoulder joint for what, three or four years now? Something like and that. And st- it's not, not old hat. I have to always focus on it. Yeah. It's hard to change those um, habits. Learned habits. Yeah, it's just habits. Yeah. It's motor patterns. So my focus now is what's the most simple movement that someone can make that's still going to be fast mm-hmm. and still help them not injure themselves. Um, so we're talking about the recovery now. But I want to kind of just skip ahead to the propulsive phase. Are we done with the relaxed recovery? We're done talking about the recovery for the moment. Because we're going to circle back around to it. Because like I said. relaxed recovery. Not even relaxed recovery. Just recovery. recovery. Okay. Period. Um, Got it. Because like I had said at the beginning, they're connected. Mm-hmm. And so I want to talk about the propulsive phase so people understand a little bit more about the recovery. Uh, and why I think it's important to focus on the recovery. A lot of coaches don't like to focus on the recovery because they feel, well, it's not in the water. It's not a force that's going to be moving the swimmer forward. Uh, Why do I care how they move above the water line? Well, we'll talk about that. Um, Later. So, the propulsive phase consists of three portions. The catch, the power phase, and the finish. Please notice... We're not calling it the pull. It's not a pull. Do you want to say power phase or propulsive phase? I thought we were saying propulsive phase. The propulsive phase of freestyle has three phases within it. Misunderstood. That's all right. Um, So it's the catch, the power phase, and the finish. For, in my opinion, as long as I can remember, people have been obsessed with the catch phase. Mm Mm-hmm. Everyone wants to know how to set their catch, and everyone has a different way of saying how to set their catch, and everyone wants you to set your catch differently. Mm -hmm. It's kind of bizarre that it's so, like, talked about. Um, It's important. Yeah. It's absolutely important. Don't get me wrong. Especially if you go back and look at Katie Ledecky from the beginning of her craziness and being super, super fast. She had a bad catch. She's barely catching. You look at her now, she had the best catch I've ever seen. She broke world records 
both times. What, what do you mean she had a bad catch? She would drop, let her hand in, drop a little before catching, and now she's the fastest catch in the West. East. <laughs> sure. South, north, <laughs> everywhere. Fastest catch ever. Um, you watch that video, and I don't even understand how she's catching so quickly. But she wasn't always like that, even when she was incredibly fast and breaking records. In 2012, if you go back and look at Kayla Decky swim underwater, her catch was what was coined the early vertical forearm catch, um, which is quite dangerous, meaning it puts the already vulnerable shoulder joint in more of a vulnerable position mm -hmm. uh, in order to generate a paddle that's actually in a position of weakness and then telling people to pull. And it, it, it can very, very quickly turn into an injury. And there no evidence that it was actually faster than if you let your forearm be not straight up and down. So it's hard to talk about because it's really much easier to show images of. Yeah. But Katie Ledecky's, will say, early vertical forearm, when you did that, your fingertips would point straight down to the bottom. We still want an early Which, thinking catch. Thinking about it, to me, the only way I would be able to do that is if my shoulder joint pops out. I don't even know how to make that movement properly. Um, it's not easy. You'd have to have you have to have a ton of flexibility. Uh, yeah, and not and everyone even is then, Katie Ledecky. The flexibility that's required of it is putting your shoulder in a really dangerous position. So right, that's it's what not I was even, trying to say. Yeah, it's, it's, it seems super not good for your body. It's No, it's not. It really isn't. Um, so Don't try this at home, kids. Now the goal should be set your catch as early as possible, making sure your fingertips are pointing slightly downward so that your forearm and your hand would be more at a, like a diagonal, pointing towards, like if you were swimming on top of the black line, it would be pointing towards the opposite side of, of the lane, right? So if I was catching with my left hand, my fingertips, if I were able to like have a laser pointer on my fingertips, mm -hmm. would be pointing to the right side of the lane on the bottom of the pool. Right. All right? So I think it's important to note the catch and say, yes, what's important about the catch is a really about creating a paddle. So how early can you create a paddle? This is not like a magical position that makes you automatically faster. Right. We wanna make sure you're using your hand, your forearm, and your bicep as that paddle when you first start. The further you can set it, the better you're going to be, okay? Mm -hmm. So if that means you've entered the water and you're letting your hand drift down eight to 10 inches before you set your catch, that would be a late catch. You're yeah. already about to be in your power phase, so you're not really generating any forward propulsion at that point. So then you're losing a third of you your got propulsive it. phase, pretty much. Yep, a you third. got it. So it's not about how far you can reach. It is only about how far can you set your paddle and how early can you set your paddle. So once you've set your paddle, you should think of it um, like your elbow is going to be pointing slightly outward and rolling forward to the, the front of the pool or, or to the front of the direction you're traveling. Right. So we don't even like to use the term keep your elbow up because that can have such a negative impact on how people actually move and they don't even realize it. Yeah. I just try to ask people to make sure they don't uh, let their elbow get too far below the surface before they have set their paddle. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and it, it's a, it's, a, you have to learn this in phases. I would say learn the movement first and then see if you can get it a little bit better by keeping it closer to the surface, which requires a lot more mobility and flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, but practice makes better, not perfect. So just keep trying at it and you'll get it. Film yourself so you can see what paddle you actually have. I actually ask people to cheat, look at their arm, Ooh. right? Every once in a while, take a look at your arms and see what it is that they're doing. You're just practicing, so there's no rule that says that you can't just look. Right. Just look. Um, I try to stay away from asking people to feel things because I don't trust that they will actually yeah, feel the hard. right things. Cause I, feel, I mean, just because I feel something doesn't mean that everyone else is going to feel it, but it also doesn't mean that I'm wrong and they're wrong if they don't. Right. Yeah. Um, so we have a paddle. 
also known as the catch, right? So we've set that catch. Number we've one. generated this beautiful paddle. Mm -hmm. The goal is to keep the paddle as long as possible, okay? So you set it as early as possible, you keep it as long as possible. So from the catch going into the power phase, it's very, very simple. All it really is, is your shoulder blade shrugging downward towards your back pocket as your arm moves with your shoulder blade. Your shoulder blade is the base of your arm, not your shoulder joint. Don't get it confused. So say that again, shoulder blade. So Sh your catch into your power phase is super simple. All it is, is the movement of your shoulder blade shrugging up. Shrugging down. Shrugging down. Right. So your shoulder blade is shrugging down as your arm is moving back and your shoulder blade has to move down uh, in order to A, prevent injury and B, to be powerful. Mm -hmm. um, it's very common when you see someone, usually I see it in younger swimmers, but they're trying to move a lot of force and so you see their shoulder joints shoot up towards their ears as they try to pull through. Mm. All right? There's them using their upper trap to try to pull and not their lats and their mid trap and their rhomboids and all those muscles back there. Um, so in order to use your full back, I like to think about shoulder blades moving down. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now that your shoulder blade has moved down, you're moving from the power phase, which is probably going to end with your forearm being about the bottom rib, the beginning of your waist. Okay. And then you would move into the finish. This is really easy, but overly complicated to people and has been bastardized over the years. Bastardized. That's right. I'm very passionate Good about this because I think people should not be obsessed about the catch, but they should be obsessed about the finish. Okay. So I just the, talked about that on our Instagram page the other day, that no one pays any attention to the finish of your stroke. The most advice I got growing up about finishing my stroke was touch my thigh. Bad. Which is good if you don't know how long your arm is good if you're learning to swim right because you're figuring out that movement you're learning the basic movement and then you fix it later right bad if you're actually trying to go fast right so what we mean by this is once your shoulder blade is down and your forearm is about at your bottom rib it's an extension from your elbow that you are looking for you don't want your elbow to move in towards your ribs. You want to think of it almost like a tricep press or a, a stiff arm movement, mm -hmm. right? The goal should be to slightly feather your hand out completely under the water so that your palm can remain facing behind you and your fingertips at this point would be pointing pretty much right down towards the bottom. Mm -hmm. So at no point, once your hand has entered the water, do your fingertips point directly forward. So from the very beginning of your entry, they're still pointing slightly down. They're not pointing directly forward. Mm -hmm. You catch, they're pointing diagonally down. In your power phase, they start pointing straight down. And in the finish, they are pointing straight down or maybe a little off to the side. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, it wouldn't even make sense to have them pointing straight forward because what is that doing? Nothing. Well, it's for beginners, people are, are, are constantly taught to make sure their arms are going straight into the water. But that then just teaches you to glide unnecessarily. Sure. It, it teaches you to glide you unnecessarily. Bad habits and inefficient timing of your stroke. It can mess up your timing. It can mess up your balance as well if you have your mm -hmm. hands too high to the surface. Um, so there's a lot that's going on in all this stuff. And, and I think for this podcast, I wanted to kind of cover the, the basis of it. Because mm -hmm. I think we could probably have a six podcast series on just how to catch. Oh, yeah. All right? I mean, it could be... We can go in great detail about it, actually. The um, nuances and minutia of the sport of swimming are just obscene. So many little obscene. things. Obscene. Obscene. Obscure. Not ridiculous. Absurd. Crazy. Absurd. Absurd. They all <laughs> technically work. <laughs> They're obscene. You can make them all work. How you dare can... you show me your catch like that? That is so uncouth. <laughs> so, um, going back to the finish. So, with the finish... The tricep is really important, and the tricep connects to the shoulder blade. So if your shoulder blade is down, your tricep can fully be used. But if your mm -hmm. shoulder is hiked up and your shoulder blade is not sitting down, your tricep can't be fully used. But you're trying to use it. But you're attempting. Therefore... So it's just going to be weak. Yep. So Injury. something else to keep in mind, something that I've become 
fascinated by and obsessed with as of like the last month is if the shoulder blade is down and the tricep is being utilized, I mean, and your elbow is extended and you have resistance on that paddle, your corresponding side obliques will automatically react to this and cause core tension, which means... React and not... You're not sitting there trying to keep your muscles tight. Exactly. You're not forcing it. It's a reaction, and that's what we want from your core. We don't ever want your core to be forced. So this is incredibly important to think about and to understand. If you can keep a paddle from the moment that you enter the water, you set your paddle up front during the catch phase, so that during the power phase you keep that paddle, your core is going to react to that. It's going to have tension automatically as long as you have good posture. But where everyone loses it is in the finish. Because as you rotate, your arm gets pulled inward towards your body. Automatically. Automatically. Yep. Because your arm is attached to your body. Hands turn sideways so that your palms face towards your thighs, which is bad. Mm -hmm. Because now you've lost you your paddle. Forward. What are you using as a paddle now? Nothing. Nothing. So you end up slicing through the water. Because you don't have that resistance and leverage for your core to react to, it goes to the wayside and your body goes, ah, I don't know what to do anymore. Legs go all over the place to help compensate for the lack of balance or people start overarching in their back to help for a lack of balance or people start doing weird things with their lead arm to, to compensate for the lack of balance. So we've actually seen in swim box, if people keep a paddle, their balance automatically improves. It's keeping the paddle at the very end of the stroke that's very difficult. Um, if you could picture somebody ice skating when they're ice skating, in order to move forward, they're pushing back and slightly out in order to move forward. Well, that's what hands are supposed to do in the water. Oh, that's cool. Right? It's the same thought also with kayaking or crew, mm -hmm. right? When you have a paddle in the water, you have to feather it outward before you take it out. Mm -hmm. So it's like a gradual process to remove it versus a sudden motion to just honestly, like jerk it up out of the water. And that allows you to maintain the momentum that you've been building and keeping as opposed to just stopping and having to start all right. over again. Right. So the way the, the physics works for swimming is where you plant your paddle, that's why I said you have to plant it as early as possible and mm -hmm. far out in front of you as possible, where you plant your paddle, you swim past that anchor point which you've created with your Which paddle. Which you've created with your paddle. That's an anchor point. So the longer you can keep that anchor point, the further you're going to go with each stroke. And you're going to maintain momentum. And you're going to maintain that core tension that we just talked about. Mm -hmm. All right? So this is how important the paddle that you create is. It's not just about propulsion. It's also about stability. Which is, in my opinion, the most important thing in swimming. Is can you be stable? So many things rely on that. You wouldn't even know it. Right. So if you think about that feathering out motion or hooking out motion or that, that pushing away motion, as you rotate, you push away, your arm should be fully extended. And when I say fully extended, I don't mean 100% extended. I mean right. like 95% extended because we don't want to lock any joints out. And if you're listening to this and you're looking at your elbow when your arm is extended and it, it turns inward because you're hypermobile, that means you like to go to like 105 or 110% extended. Like Lissa, if you're on watching the video, you can see Lissa <laughs> hypermobile elbow. All right, so that way you have to make sure you don't lock your joints. When you lock your joints, you're not going to have that resistance to push against. It's that joint that takes all that resistance. We don't want that. Your your core can't react to that. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you're feathering out, you're pushing out. Your arm is like a 95% extended. As it moves outward. You're rotating, so your hip is coming up, so your hand will automatically exit the water. The rotation does that work for you. It does a good majority of that work. Mm -hmm. Not 100%, but a lot of it. Right. Um, I think a lot of the things in swimming that people don't realize are that your body will react properly when your technique is also correct. You're just helping it along. Yeah, I mean... It's basically you have to get everything set up in the right place mm -hmm. and then things start falling into the right place. Right. But if you don't set it up correctly, they're not going to fall in correctly. That's why so many people say words like, oh, that stroke is so smooth. Yep. I can't think of the other one I was going to use. <laughs> Another one. I was I, like, you got anything else? What else do you it got? It was better than smooth. <laughs> I can't remember. But it should effortless. look effortless. Yeah, it's supposed to look effortless. Because you're not supposed to be right. fighting the water, you're working with the water, you're working with your body, 
You just have to learn how to do that and make the movement proper. Your body's not going to want to fight against you. Right. So if you've generated resistance on that paddle all the way back, as soon as the hand exits the water, you don't have any more resistance to push against. Your arm will should automatically start to come forward because of kinetic energy. So your ligaments have uh, elasticity to them, and if they're pushing and being elongated, they will snap back. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's free energy. You don't have to actually try to move your arm forward. It will move forward by itself. You might have to try a little bit towards the end of the, the recovery, all right? But this is what I was coming back to is, let's circle back around to the recovery when we talk about- Back to the recovery. When we talk about the finish, right? Because the finish right. is the beginning of the recovery. The recovery is the end of the finish. They are connected. Say it one more time. The finish is the beginning of the recovery. The finish is the beginning of the recovery. And the recovery is the end of the finish. And the recovery is the end of the finish. You got Just it. Just wanted to reiterate. I think it's a pretty important thing to It's understand. super important, and it's weird because I think people have been coached to touch their thigh, and that's the finish of their stroke. Now take your arm out, but that's not really what's happening. Right. Your finish is a zone. So I think of the finish basically being from the waist down to your front pockets if you're wearing pants. All right, so obviously not when you're in your swimsuit. You don't have any <laughs> front pockets. <laughs> At least I hope not. Um, this would be an interesting swimsuit. It would cause a lot of drag I would imagine um, so if you can think about your hand kind of pushing back and sliding out in that that I don't know what is that eight inch zone yeah depending on how tall you are I guess but you know that that same zone I think of the finish is happening in a zone so as you finish that zone mm -hmm. your hand is starting to breach the surface that's the ending point of your finish it comes into your recovery right all right so they're connected really it is one movement you're making loops you're making loops loops after loops after loops pretty There's much no stopping and swimming so i should see when someone finishes in my mind when someone's finishing properly mm -hmm. i should see basically their whole arm breaking the surface at the same time and their fingertips should be the last thing to exit the water because okay. their fingertips should be pointing down. Okay. All right. Their arm won't be break exiting the water at the same exact time, but it will be very close. Right. It's going to look, I mean, when someone's moving that quickly. Right. So now that they're going back into the recovery, this is where a straight arm recovery is really fantastic because mm -hmm. you just let your arm follow that path. You're not trying to pick your elbow up. As long as your elbow is relaxed, and kind of rolling forward towards the front of you, it's gonna be in a good place. Right. And I think it's really important to note rolling forward in front of you. You don't want your elbow to roll back. Because as soon as your elbow rolls back or your hand goes forward without your elbow, mm -hmm. your shoulder blade sits down. Oh. And when is your sh shoulder blade supposed to sit down? Not ever. No. We just talked about it. During the power phase. Oh, sorry. It's all right. See, I already messed up because I was thinking <laughs> that it was going to stop and I started over. I lost the whole loop concept that I just <laughs> talked about. Right? So the recovery brings the shoulder blade forward. Shoulder blade has to be forward so that you can catch and then it can come back down during the power phase. A loop. It's a, it's a loop. It's all a loop. Yeah. It's all cyclical. Um, so as you recover, the shoulder blade's coming back forward. Mm -hmm. Your hip is rotating downward to place your hand or your arm into the water so your shoulders not trying to place your hand into the water we want your I like to think of your arm as an extension of your hip so the arm okay. bone is connected to the hip bone like Lissa said we're not doctors I don't know but I'm pretty sure the I hip bone is connected to the arm bone connected to your hip bone in swimming it is can you imagine that little arm yes I can't imagine that Oof. <laughs> not cute so we want to make sure the hip is placing the arm in, shoulder blade's mm -hmm. been lifted f forward towards the top rib or towards your ear because of your recovery. You should be able to set your catch slightly inward. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my favorite cues that one of our clients uses for herself is uh, she was raking her poker chips in. All right, so we don't- Who uses that? I'm not gonna give that person's name out, but I love that. So <laughs> it's not like a, a huge elbow movement that you're raking in. Uh -huh. You're barely, like you're wrapping your arm around the poker chips and then you're going to use your shoulder blade to pull them in. I want to think of those as actual chips. 
Because I only make like these, potato chips. these kind of movements when I'm trying to say this or blaze is my Doritos. food. <laughs> oh, Blaze Doritos. If you guys haven't had those, whew, please sponsor us Doritos. Blaze Doritos, guys. Not an ad. Just so good. <laughs> so we want to make sure shoulder blades are in the right place mm-hmm. so that we can have mobility to set our catch. Set the catch properly so you have a good paddle. Mm-hmm. Um, shoulder blade comes down. Elbow extends. Repeat. Over and over and over again. There's that loop again. Yes. Now, that is an oversimplification. Oversimplification for sure. If but that's pe- how you need to start. You need to take yes. these things simple at first. Otherwise, you're never going to get it and you'll be too frustrated to even try. Yes. So I think the biggest thing to, to kind of keep in mind is that skating analogy. Oh, that's You great. have to slide out. Yeah. Um, my also one of my favorite analogies recently is uh, being a penguin on ice. All these things go back to being on ice, but when you're a penguin and you're on your belly and you have these little wings, they're always in your front plane pushing against the ice. They never are back Outward. behind them. Yes, pushing exactly. You outward. have to have your your little human wings, also known as arms, on the front plane of you. Right. As soon as they get side of, on the side of you, they stop being able to propel you forward, and we don't call it a pull. Because you're not really pulling. You're not pulling anything. Yeah. You're just not pulling. It's not a pull. It's a press more than anything. And I think that using that word actually gives the wrong mental idea of what you want to be doing, which is one reason why people have so many shoulder injuries. So yeah. many So many injuries related to swimming, when they think they're doing something right, when you're really not just because of one word. I think... Um, the pulling idea also leads to people scooping where they're like pushing up against the surface of the water towards the middle to the end of their stroke. That like that terrible drill when every every little kid, at least when I was a kid, you Can had you this up for ridiculous me, drill where mm-hmm. you were working on pushing the water back while you're swimming. So like we would get in trouble if our hand didn't have a huge like splash to follow it at the end right so you're getting here and you're pushing as hard as you can you're getting in trouble if you're not because that's what people used to teach and that's just incorrect i've seen a drill where in freestyle you exit the water and you try to touch the surface of the water on the opposite side of your hip so if you exit the water with your right hand you try to touch behind you on the left side terrible I, like, drill don't even understand how i would do that i'd roll over onto my back or i'd rip my shoulder out i think they people like to use it as a rotation drill but it's completely teaching the That's wrong terrible rotation thing to do in swimming freestyle in everything not to mention <laughs> in everything in all aspects rotation finish well if you if have... i'm rotating all the way over so i can touch that part i'm on my back no, you don't have to be on your back. But you're almost on your back. I'm basically on my back. You're and guess what happens when you flip over onto your back? Well, so, actually, in freestyle, you don't get disqualified, so never mind. So, um, if you have a good paddle and have a good catch, power face, and finish, mm-hmm. you will actually start to rotate properly without having to even think about it. It's kind of amazing. So I think in the rotation episode, we talked about like where does rotation, ta- rotation come from? Uh-huh. And I could not give a clear answer because it doesn't come from one place. Your arms have a role to play, your hips have a role to play, and your legs have a role to play. So if your arms are doing what they're supposed to do correctly, you will rotate. If you have good posture and your arms are doing what they're supposed to do, you will rotate. Mm-hmm. Your kick will help support that. You don't have to force it. Your kick will help support it. And that's where most people get in trouble with rotation. They start using their kick more than they should well, because they don't have anchor points. People get in trouble with that in any when they're working on any part of swimming because you forget that it's all connected. Yeah. Everything relies on something else during and any stroke, any of the four strokes, and you can't just fix one one thing. Yeah. It's I mean, never just one thing. There is no one thing. It's hard to coach as well because we want to isolate things so people can understand. Right. But then we start thinking about the stroke in these different aspects. And it's really more connected. And Mm -hmm. and if you can kind of think globally as you isolate, it helps understand why we isolate certain things. Right. But I think you just have to keep that in. Like, obviously, like, working on stuff, you have to work on something one at a time. But, like, keeping that in mind, like, everything affects everything else in your stroke. 
So you have to you have to be aware of that. Some. It's hard to give you a bunch of drills on the podcast that might help. My recommendation is that you just check out our YouTube channel. Um, we have a ton of drills on our YouTube channel for the recovery, the catch, and the finish. Uh, some of our favorite probably be triangle drill, mm-hmm. egg oh, beater that's drill. A good one. Egg beater drill is like one of my favorite ones. Egg beater drill is fun to watch. Um, I like to do a straight arm, like fingertip drag, or really like arm drag. So you just get used to the idea of dragging your there's, straight arm on the surface. There's also that video that shows the differences in a straight arm recovery oh, yeah, that's and right. a relaxed arm recovery. There's a video. We have a YouTube video that compares the two recoveries. Mm-hmm. Which is good to watch even for me because I know the differences and still sometimes it's hard to get all of that out. Yeah. So I have to look at them sometimes. Like, all right, got it. Yeah. So, you know, going back to the recovery stuff, traditionally speaking, sprinters use a straight arm recovery. Mm -hmm. Um, Why would you say that? Real quick. So they use a straight arm recovery for two reasons. Um, So that they keep their arms opposite from one another. Mm -hmm. So there's not a front quadrant freestyle. There's no glide. There shouldn't be a glide in freestyle anyway. And then they can also limit or, I don't want to say limit, they can recover with less hip rotation, which then increases their cadence. Right. Uh, and that's part of the reason why I have been moving to a straighter arm recovery, not perfectly straight, but in open water swimming especially, you need to be able to change your cadence depending on situations. And... Everyone that wants to change their cadence should realize the cadence comes from the hips, not their arms. So if you want to manipulate how fast you're actually moving your limbs, Mm -hmm. you have to manipulate your hips. Right. And the the safest way to do that is to have a straighter arm recovery. That makes sense to me. Well, good. Because sometimes I feel like when I talk, I don't always make sense. (laughs) Eh, me too. Um, So check out the YouTube channel. There's a ton of videos on there. Mm -hmm. So if you just... YouTube swim box, you will find us. We'll put in a link. We will put in a link as well. Um, and then as far as just trying to practice this, my thoughts are basically, I have two thoughts really about it. Don't go looking for resistance. So mm-hmm. when you're swimming, don't try to find spots in the water where you feel like it's heavy. Like, oh, I'm pushing a lot of weight. Because that doesn't nece- necessarily mean you have found a good place for a paddle. That probably means you're wasting energy and you're way too deep. It could be that you're deep or it could be that you're too out to the side as well. Mm -hmm. So it could be that you just found a weak position to be in and your body is tricking you and believing that it's strong but you're just weak. You're just in a weak spot. So don't go looking for the resistance. Generate the paddle. Go through the movements. You will go fast. I don't know if I've ever had a swim, uh, one of my fastest swims ever, when I got out and was like, oh my God, I felt like I was throwing weights around it, it never felt like no. that it always feels like that was effortless and it was effortless because i was just generating a good paddle right. and going through the motions i wasn't trying to actually like pull a lot of weight yeah there's and a th- reason why the sport is so pretty right i think people always want to find weight to throw around in the water mm-hmm. and that's what they they kind of mess up but they put themselves in vulnerable positions and then they hurt themselves yeah um so that's my thoughts basically don't go looking for resistance generate a good paddle find the correct path for that paddle to travel on uh, and since we're talking about it there is not an s curve to be followed it's not a straight back pull either but it's kind of a straight back pull as we talked about before as you rotate your arm gets pulled into you so if mm-hmm. you were to follow the path of your arm from your shoulder line basically right it would be straight until about the bottom rib and then it would curve inward towards your thigh okay. if you don't make any adjustments right it's the right thing. so we're we're proposing that it's straight back until about the bottom rib and then it's a slight sweep out because as you rotate it will make your arm actually finish in a straight line. Mm-hmm. So you do have to do some correction in order for it to finish in a straight line. But definitely not. But it feels outward. Yeah, no S's. Like I was taught when I was six years old, S pull, keyhole pull. What is this doing, this movement? Wasting time. 
wasting energy. Right. Well, it used to be thought that the longer your arm was in the water, the more propulsion you'd generate. Well, then why didn't we teach? And like, it's true. A that is a true statement. But what was misunderstood was every time your hand changes uh, positions, like you lose that anchor point, you're mm-hmm. setting a new anchor point. So you're constantly setting and losing anchor it's points. You're efficient. losing propulsion. So every time your hand changes planes, you lose propulsion. So don't let your hand change planes. Right. Efficiency. Simple. <laughs> want to be efficient. All right. Uh, any last thoughts from you before we end this podcast? It's all about the lube. It's all about, it's the, all loop? about the loop. I, I heard lube at first, by the way. No. This <laughs> podcast is family friendly. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't think you've heard all of our podcasts then. So I said this. I didn't oh, say all. This I one. said this one. Okay. Got it. All about the loop. Good. Uh, That's all I got. Everything's connected. If you want to learn more about the catch in the pool, um, oh my god, I said pull. If you want to learn more about ah! the recovery and the propulsive phase, woof, that was embarrassing. Right there, man. If you want to learn more about the recovery phase and the propulsive phase, check out our YouTube channel. There's a ton of content on there. We're always happy to answer questions too. Um, yep. So you can just go to the Swimbox website and email us if you have any questions. Uh, or if you're on our Instagram, let us know. DM us. Uh, we're Swimbox on Instagram as, as well. Swim underscore box. There you go. So we're always available to answer questions, and we're always happy to answer questions. Uh, the next time, next podcast. Coming up next, number six. Number six. We're going to be talking about some open water skills. Ooh. So just like we did these first five, we ran through like the sort of fundamentals of freestyle that we, we need to be good freestylers. It is open water season where we're at mm-hmm. uh, in the Washington, D.C. area. So we're going to be talking about open water skills that you need to be incorporating and things that you need to be thinking about for open water for like the next five to six podcasts. I'm excited. I am too. I love open water. All right. So we are done. We will hopefully podcast sometime soon sometime and get this up soon. within the next couple of weeks. Thanks for listening, guys.